I'm very privileged actually to be here in conversation with Nimi, whose writings I admire. I was privileged to have read her first book called The Community Catalyst, which is about a bureaucrat and in a sense is a biography. Uh, this is a very, very different book. It actually takes you to the heartland of India and then contrasts it with and juxtaposes it with what's happening in the corridors of power in New Delhi. And in many ways, it is also an extremely layered book, not just in terms of content, but also in terms of style. And I think this is something that uh, the Washington Post critic, he's actually the bureau chief of the Washington Post in Cairo, Sudarshan Raghavan, pointed out when he describes Hunger's Daughters. And I quote, Nirmala Govindarajan's terrific new novel is a tour de force. The book's powerful prose brings alive a mother's anguished quest for love, identity, and meaning in life. Yet her novel is also a vivid portrait of life in a rural Indian community dealing with its own hidden secrets. And by melding the two narratives, the author achieves stylistic brilliance while offering a stirring social commentary on modern India. With each sentence, the reader eagerly wants to read more. I'd pay particular attention to the last two sentences which is by melding the two narratives, which I just told you. The rural countryside with what's happening in urban India and the corridors of power on the one hand, there's a very, very strong social commentary on what's happening in India in the here and now. And the other is the last sentence. With each sentence, the reader eagerly wants to read more. And that pertains to the style that Nimi has used in, or her pen has used, in etching this book. And both these issues are issues that we're going to talk about in more detail today. And my gosh, Nimi, I mean, you've got so many issues in terms of content. You've got missing children, you've got gender, you've got in a sense a little bit about the Me Too movement, you've got corruption, you've got, of course, hunger. So many issues. So. How come so many issues in this book? Your thoughts? Um, actually, they were. It was. It was born out of a personal experience when I first travelled to Orissa, um, and I saw this little girl child in a in a village called Gochagora. I've called the village Bochagora in uh, in this book. And that day when we went there, her mother had just left home. It was a tribal village, right? And um, so. It actually struck me, and then I started thinking, because thereafter I s we traveled to a lot more places, and all these issues that have come out in the book are, uh, are based on the things that could possibly happen to people in these rural communities. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think, I think the title itself, Hunger's Daughters, that's what got me thinking. And it resonated very, very sharply with me a couple of weeks ago, when I was actually doing a bit of a travel yatra myself, I was privileged to have been invited to celebrate the anniversary of India's first grassroots community radio station, um, which was on the 15th of October. And I was rereading Nimi's draft at that time while I was traveling to Pastapur, which is where the community radio station is located. Pastapur is located in one of the most arid regions of this country, in Medak district in Telangana. What is very, very interesting about this station is that it is not only India's first grassroots community radio station, it is also India's first woman's community radio station. It is managed and run entirely by women. It is also India's first Dalit women's radio station. Dalit women, women, gender politics, it is also importantly a community radio station which has transformed a village which is confronted by drought into an area where food scarcity is not an issue anymore. And that is something which was an eye-opener for me. There was so much learning. I think in many ways that's what Hunger's daughter daughters deals with. What can we learn from these women 
in the heartland of what is Naksha country, Orissa, Nimi? Um, one is immense bravery, you know, to live in an environment uh, where so much is happening, where children are getting kidnapped from school by Nakshals, where the mining uh, powers that be are, you know, eating into your lands, where there are animals in the jungle, where there is the fear of going out and, you know, uh, answering nature's call in the dark of the night, you know, and I think these women are so strong and so uh, able to deal with life and its circumstances as, com as opposed to someone who lives in the city. And, you know, uh, they face issues that we don't even know exist. And that's what, you know, kind of came. Sure. I'm not going to give you more about this, but I'm going to, you know, what resonated with me was, uh, was something which, which, which was triggered off by an encounter at Pastapur. So as we were sitting over there uh, at Pastapur celebrating the 10th anniversary with, of this really, really wonderful community radio station with these Dalit women taking center stage, there was, um, there was a, a very well-intentioned development worker from a multilateral a government agency who said, well, all this is all very well. But you know, uh, let me ask you, and he referred to uh, the community radio station manager there. Her name is General Narsama. General because she has a really powerful voice. And she said, you know, you talk about all these issues of food security, but what have you done about our Prime Minister's Swatch, uh, Swatch India campaign? You know, couldn't you have improved the sanitation in your village? So there was a bit of a silence. Um, and there was a bit, and that silence was telling. The fact of the matter is that the campaign is undoubtedly very important. But what the esteemed gentleman had failed to notice was that actually sanitation was not an issue. The women had worked it out despite the fact that water was in short supply. What was an issue was food scarcity. The way General answered his question was, I think, to me, very inspirational. She said, your, I take your point, sir, and this is a very, very important campaign, but surely we have a right to choose what to us is more important, and to us combating hunger is critical to life. And of course we recognize the importance of Swachh Bharat, but please look around you. Look around you, look at the land, look at rural hygiene, and leave it to us to make up our minds. In many ways, your book, actually, the women, whether it is Minnal, who is known as the lesser known goddess, or Nelly, or who becomes the goddess of love, or so many of your other characters over there, Sushanti, um, they all provide answers. Answers, whether that's fact or fiction, I leave you to answer, Nimi. But that's the extraordinary part of your story. The thin line between fact and fiction. Right. I think any author who's written a novel will tell you there is a thin line between fact and fiction. Is that true, Poily Not always. Not always, okay. Yeah. But yeah. let me ask you, what yeah. was your learning from these women? They're so very powerful women. They knew yeah. and, and some yeah. of them, you said, are real flesh and blood people too. Real, all of them are real flesh and blood people, actually speaking. So each one of them. And um, uh, Sushanti is actually based on the character of the little girl uh, I met, you know, when, uh, whose mother had gone missing. Uh, the lesser known goddess was an elderly lady I just met on, outside a temple in Mayavaram when I'd gone uh, with my parents. Uh, on a temple trip and uh, she was 101 years old and just sitting there toothless and uh, I asked her what's your name she said I don't know <laughs> said um, uh, where are your children they've gone somewhere how many children have you, have you got 10 or 12 or something <laughs> so it was really cute and then uh, so she became one of my characters and then Gaurava so once when we had gone on a social, uh, uh, I had, we had gone on a documentation trip to Gulbarga and I had met a lady who seemed rather strong, taking care of her children and then she fed us all this lovely meal and things like that. So she became one of the characters. So each one of these children I had met there, some of these characters I picked from here and there and it 
just flowed into the book. Sure. Yeah. I'm not actually, I'm there, there, there are many more telling answers, so I th urge you to ultimately buy that book to find out those answers. I'm going to ask Munira now to actually read excerpts from the epilogue, which will give us a flavor, I think, into what drove Nimi into writing this book. Thanks. Around six years ago, when my good friend Catherine Raja expressed the need for documentation material on the NGO Development Focuses projects in Orissa, Chhattisgarh, and Jharkhand, I took a week off from my journalistic duties at the Times of Bangalore and set out on a journey that inadvertently decided my future as a writer. I followed Cathy through terrains I did not know existed on the Indian map. I met emotions I did not know would divest me of my deep-rooted beliefs that a girl bred in a city with easy access to quality education develops as a city girl with no roots in rural India. I believed that life is equal and ours to mold by pursuing our dreams. I presumed that reservations were the foil of, an, of a non-democratic environment as much as it provoked my ego, as much as it provoked my ego to see young girls being pampered, having it easy in the city. Possibly because I started earning as a 13-year-old, my father who had plum assignments plummeted at his peak and I, prodded by both my parents, took pride in earning while I learned. Years later, when I came face to face with the little girls of the hamlets of Baudh, Bolangir and Kionjhar districts in one of India's poorest states, Orissa, I found myself documenting a program called Earn While You Learn. This initiative was helmed by the founding trustee of Development Focus, Mr. Thomas Paul, who after spending a few years in the corporate sector, had dedicated his life to developmental work. The honorary assignment I had undertaken was meant to raise awareness amongst possible donors to support the cause of enabling the children of these forest hamlets to, try to thrive in their environment and live off their own lands. The road to these hamlets involved an overnight journey from Bhubaneswar, and on my first visit, I clung onto the window by my seat on the rickety red government bus to Kionjar district, towns and forests and deep green mountains where the nakshals are camped. The gushing water bodies and the mining equipment swept my vision and left my mind in a blur. And then I met the little girls of the deep forest hamlets, and particularly one girl whose mother had gone missing on the day that we arrived at her home. All this on my first day, on my first visit to Orissa with Kathy. On another trip, traveling alone to Parikmal, I wondered I wandered out of my safe hotel room and into the lodging's common dining area at the nearest big town, Bolangir. Just one more table was occupied that night. Four rice traders, all men dressed in printed shirts, conversed in a mix of Telugu and Uriya. As I watched their gemstone ringed fingers swoosh back and forth in that dimly lit restaurant air, and their thick moustaches growing soggy with the rum and Pepsi they sipped at more than regular intervals, I overheard them trading deals of not just rice, but flesh from the mining district of Orissa. They were talking of trading little girls from this region, some as young as three and their own relatives were involved in the exchange thanks to the never-ending cycle of poverty that becomes a region where mining, legal or illegal, devastates the land and its people. That night, I left my meal untouched, fled back to my hotel room, bolted the door, and prayed fervently for the safety of the little girls in the forest hamlets. Traveling home the following day, I had no heart to leave the little girls, all playing, working, laughing, crying, taking care of their younger siblings in the distant hamlets of Orissa. Back in the city, and many soul-searching conversations later, I sat by the French window at Bangalore Showcase Cafe Koshi's Chill Out and began to write the story of Hunger's Daughters.
Thanks, Munira. So that gives you a bit of an insight into what drove Nimi to write this book and why this book is so compelling. Okay, One of the reasons which makes it doubly compelling, I found, Nimi, was the way you've penned the narrative and the way you've blended the political conflict and the personal conflict. You've blended the personal and the political in some ways that it's led me to ask a question that how much of you is there in the book? How much of you is there in the protagonist? How much of does the protagonist identify with some of the other characters in the book, like Sush Sushanti? So if you could share some s insights yeah. in that. Uh, there's a lot of me uh, in the protagonist. Uh, and a lot of people I know as well in the protagonist. Uh, they are both my experiences as well as experiences of other people who've gone through similar situations in life. And um, also you know, the fact that Sushanti's parents were lost, her father had gone missing, and then we, we've all gone through similar emotions as youngsters. Uh, those things also kind of uh, percolated into the main character. But uh, yeah, so that's how it is. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, what adds to the rawness, let's come to style right now, is the kind of style that Nimi has deployed. Uh, another critic, Jant Kotkarni, actually brings this out when he says that this reads like a raw journal, like a raw journal-like narrative, which is a welcome departure. And one of the things I found while I was reading this was that the book is entirely written in the present tense. This, of course, is also true of your book, The Community Cat Catalyst. Is this something that you usually do, or did you particularly layer this for a particular reason when you wrote this book? Uh, this style comes to me naturally because <laughs> I like the here and now and um, and I feel every time I open the pages to read a book when it's in present tense it just makes me feel as though I'm there right in the heart of things. So that's the style. And just to give you a glimpse of this, a little bit of that from Munira. Gaurava is an encumbrance to the khaki clad cops who have taken her into custody along with Minal. Gaurava belongs to the neighboring state of the, southern, of the southern capital. She doesn't speak the tongue of the khaki-clad men here, but Gaurava understands Meenal's tongue with the same clarity as she does her own language of loss. Gaurava's heart beats for her lost daughter. Nelly has life encumbrances. She must work hard to satisfy the mentor. Nelly must receive her payment of 20 rupees to tuck into her tortoise-shaped terracotta piggy bank every day. Nelly will abide by Amrit's instructions and perform well at her newly designated work spot in Nagao. Asha Paharia has not returned home for two days. Her mother and father, her grandmother, two younger brothers, and all the village elders are perplexed. Asha is a skilled worker, they say. Asha's brother has been absent from the fields for years, plowing the paddy fields during this season when the monsoon has smiled upon the Dalma ranges has been no difficult task for her, Asha's father says. Yeah, and we can go on and on. I'm saying the use of the present tense, the use of the is, brings out the here and now and the documentary style of the reading is sharpened hugely. And I think that adds, that adds to the layeredness of the book. There are other devices that Nimi uses. Stream of consciousness, magic realism. Uh, names become a very powerful vehicle of metaphor and I wonder where that came from. For instance, Prasad Bharati, Prasad Bharati or the uncrowned king for the Prime Minister, the capital at the end of the sea, the lesser known goddess, the Ministry of Accounting Affairs, the awakened peacekeeping mission, the cabinet of eclectic disciples. How much of this was premeditated? How much of this just flew? Your thoughts? Uh, actually, it just flowed because there were so many politicians that I was thinking of. I didn't want to take a specific name. So I just said, the uncrowned head. And then only later, in a, uh, in the, during the final edits, I gave him a name, Prasad Bharati. <laughs> because, you know, when you go to these uh, Naxal intense regions in Orissa, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, 
I know for uh, generations nothing's happened there. Doesn't matter which political party was in power. So you know, uh, uh, no leader, no political leaders ever visited uh, that village. So um, those things struck me, and I just wanted to keep it a bit ambiguous and allow people to think of whichever politician or whoever they feel like, as in how it flows for them. So yeah. I hope it was also rather clever and timely in telling, particularly today, coming today when there's so many attacks on, you know, freedom of expression, the issue of, cis of censorship. Uh, and so many other issues too. Um, I think it allows the reader's imagination not just to sort of work over time, but necessarily over time, but also in many ways it serves as a very powerful, not just social, but political commentary of our times too. Um, you know, with all this, you might think that you're reading a very dark thriller, and I did too, actually, for a while, and it, because it starts off on a very grim note. Um, and it begins, it gets more and more, you know, gloomy. And then suddenly, fantasy comes in, and you're not sure if it's fantasy. Magic realism sets in. And you realize that Nimi has suddenly flipped her style to actually subvert institutions to result in an ending which is happy to say the least. Um, I'll just give you an example. You know, all these acronyms and words that make that the, 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 the metaphors for names, one of them had to do with something which was an acronym, MDCRFP. And MDCRFP, just about the time when it was beginning to sound like a lethal, sinister design of the status quo, I'm referring to something like maybe raw or something like that, uh, I was delighted to discover when I found out that it actually stood for mission, deconstruct the cabinet, and reconstruct feminine power. <laughs> so, you know, just like the women of Pastapur had the last laugh, these women also had the last laugh. I'll let you have a few thoughts on your last laugh before we open the house for any questions if there yeah. are. Uh, so, I'm an optimistic person and I just wanted the women to triumph. So, and this book aims at bringing out uh, equality in um, making people stand up for their rights, enabling the commoner to actually come up front. So, I hope all there's something to take away from it. That's it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, that, in a nutshell, is a preface version, an insight into Hunger's Daughters. We still have a time time for any any questions or comments. Yeah, Poili, yeah, would you? I, I can. Thank you. Um, Nimi, where were all the men? <laughs> they are there in the book. So there's Swami Vishnu Premanand, there is uh, Sushanti's father, the Kalar Patra Bhaga, who's a very, very important person over here. And uh, there's also, um, uh, there are lots of men in the book who are also good guys. If I may quickly yeah. add to that, the, you know, you should read the book to find out. And that's another reason why you should read the book. And it has to do with the names, because I don't know how many of us are familiar with Koshis in Bangalore. Right, well you just have to make one more visit to Koshi's, look a little closely at some of those usual suspects. I thought that I would see some of them here, but I don't. And you will find out why, and they're all men, I might tell you, why uh, Swami Vishnu Prem Anand, as Nimi mentions, or Inspector General Tafinder Baba, <laughs> or Major Ashok Rifalwala and so many others, they come to life in uncanny ways. So Thank you, Nimi. Uh, you have a book where one looks for men. Ah, wow. <laughs> Thank you. But There's also the man in the blue kurta. There is also the man in the blue kurta. That's absolutely right. Yep. Uh, simple. Sure. Where's the book? Good question. Where's the book, Nimi? Yeah, uh, so it's right now, it's being published by Ohm Books International and it'll be on the stands in about three weeks or so. Yeah. Yeah, but Nimi's first book is available over here, uh, The Community Cap uh, Catalyst. So if you want to get an idea of a sense of Nimi's style of writing, do pick up the book over there. We have one more question over there. was reading uh, some of the experts from here 
It's, it's working. It is. Okay. Thank you. And uh, it, the tonality sounded a lot more empathetic over there. So I saw yourself in that character. And uh, because of that, uh, how much is activism? How much is characterization over there? Uh, that was the question. Uh, I, actually, I'm thinking aloud with you on this. Actually, uh, it set, started out to be activism. So <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's what is the undertone of the book. Uh, okay. Actually, any, even the previous book is a sort of activism because uh, when Sapna Book House approached me to write The Community Catalyst, right. it was about this civil servant who had come from a very poor region in India and who had started this movement called Apna Desh, which is why I kind of undertook to write that book. Right. So I think in anything I do, I'm a bit of an activist. So. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, we have a question from there. Thank you. Uh, there were a lot of uh, subjects of conflict that you've uh, mentioned are there in the book. I wanted to know how you went about, say, sifting down to uh, say, okay, I'm going to include all these different uh, subjects and uh, more of this and less of this. How did you kind of filter down to that level? Uh, actually, so if you take the title of the book, it's called Hunger's Daughters, right? So it was, so basically it's about uh, the extremely poor people who hardly have enough me f uh, money to buy their next meal, right? So that was the core topic of it. And then came with dealing with the, the other issues that came into the book were interwoven uh, in the process of dealing with the problem itself. And then there's also an underlying love story in it so <laughs>